or what the, let, do, who just, do we have there? Let's bring an that? author and political columnist, why Joe Thomas, and his book is titled The Longest Con, How Grifters, Swindlers, and Frauds Hijacked American Conservatism. And Joe, it, it's just like, I mean, come on, that, that medley right there, that montage. Yeah. It's good stuff. Just, it's just like a softball right across the center of the plate for you. Tell us about say, the book. I, I, Joe and Mika, great to see you again. I, I, I could not have asked for a better uh, intro than, than that montage, although <laughs> there's, I would say, an endless amount of footage of the same kinds of stuff. Endless. And while I was listening to you and, uh, and John here, I looked in the index of the book and found uh, former Governor Huckabee, yeah. uh, and of course he's in here. Uh, as a, mm. a guy who went into business with his mailing list from his political presidential campaign to market uh, a phony cancer cure that was supposedly a spiritual cure, a biblically based fake cancer cure. Uh, and right. that is the kind of thing that has become rampant on the right in the last several decades. And so the book sort of tells this story of how conservatives got to the point where they are milking their own constituents for every penny that they can squeeze out of them on false pretenses almost in almost every case. I mean, and the epitome of this, of course, is the former president who uh, booked a quarter of a billion dollars after the uh, 2020 election by telling people that he was going to set up an official election defense fund. And of course, the money didn't go to that, but they pulled in hundreds of millions of dollars in two months uh, after the election. And it was going, it ended up in a super PAC that he controls and that he can spend on anything, including, of course, his legal defense, not election defense, his legal defense, his personal legal defense. But uh, this is a, this is a, uh, I don't know, a syndrome, a, uh, a problem on the right that lots of conservatives have discussed. You know, the forward to the book uh, is by my friend George Conway, who I think you guys know, who uh, is a, an honest conservative, and like many honest conservatives, is appalled by the dishonesty, yeah. the grifting, the scamming that is just yep. rampant in their movement now. Um, yeah. Joe, um, I want to say, uh, first of all, Congratulations on the book. Thank you. Um, it identifies uh, grifters, swindlers, and frauds. It says the, the subtitle of the book, the book's called The Longest Con, the subtitle of the book, How Grifters, Swindlers, and Frauds Hijacked American Conservatism. It is clear that they have, and, and you point to Trump, right? Is the kind of apotheosis it's of, the, exactly. of the, the, kind of the kind of platonic ideal of grifter, swindler, and fraud all rolled into one. Boss grifter, yeah. And, and, but here's the thing, how? This is what, the, what this book promises, is an explanation of not just a description of that this has happened, right. but how it's happened. And I, this probably this is more of a PhD dissertation than a, a cable TV question on, in the morning, but what's the brief summary for how? How did that happen? It happened, John, it began, I would say, in, in, heavy, in its heaviest form with the Goldwater campaign, after the Goldwater campaign in 1964, when a man named Richard Vigory figured out that suddenly Goldwater had amassed a, a critical list of donors to his campaign. Vigory sent people to the Capitol, women, who wrote down the names of all the donors before the clerk of the House stopped them, and suddenly he had a big mailing list on magnetic tape. And what they could do was monetize those people uh, with appeals to paranoia, prejudice, fear, uh, the whole panoply hatred, the whole panoply of um, appeals that the far right has used for many years. And what they could do with that list was get them to send money. Vigory discovered, hey, we can get these people to send us money. That expanded, you know, in many directions since then. But the, but the basic appeal is the same. It's what Roger Stone said years ago, uh, Trump's top advisor, you know him. He uh, said, you know, hate is the most powerful force in politics. And if you can find a way to uh, appeal to people's basis motives, they will support you and, in this case, send you money. And the two things, uh, the two elements kind of have fused in, the, in, in the, both the Republican Party and the conservative movement as a whole.
The new book is entitled The Longest Con, How Grifter Swindlers and Frauds Hijacked American Conservatism. It goes on sale tomorrow. New York Times bestselling author Joe Connison. Thank you. And obviously Donald Trump uh, found you, liable so of massive fraud. Um, and then remember those cards, those NFTs? Oh, my gosh. Why yeah. would people uh, buy like... I think Jack has the entire set. You can print it. The- oh, wait, no, he doesn't. Okay. I, th- I don't even get that. But yeah. anywho, we'll move on. Another grift. President Biden mm. took his campaign to battleground Pennsylvania. Yeah. Jerry Nadler, who represents a district, all right, let me repeat, a district, not the Democratic Party, unlike former uh, guy who actually does represent the Republican Party. So uh, Jerry Nadler, I can tell you now this Monday, is going to be pushed to the uh, front of everything because, and Jerry Nadler of all people, uh, can we roll the tape of Jerry Nadler not exactly being articulate? Work on this subject, not part of this package, but part of uh, preserving our our, our democracy. With that, I'm pleased to yield to the distinguished chairwoman. Hold it. Run that back. Wait a minute. Go right. There, freeze that. Full screen. Okay, freeze that. Tighten up on that way. Vector in on that guy by the back wheel. On this subject, not part of this package, but part of uh, preserving our, our, our democracy. See us have the ability to add more when we need them. And I think the, the congressman's right about that fact. Jerry, you want some? Yeah, I got some. Some here, Jerry. Take a drink. You look a little dehydrated, brother. You're, you seem a little dehydrated. You okay? You want to take a drink with us to give yourself some? How you feel, man? You feel okay? You all right? Okay, you want to want to drink some of this and give you some. Electric. Sorry, Jerry Nadler is not exactly the uh, epitome of uh, articulation, is he? And um, he's playing a very silly and dangerous game because literally walking into the trap the Republicans are setting, the Republicans would love nothing more uh, than the Democrats to start biting and snapping at each other uh, over this non-campaign uh, that CNN are responsible for because CNN are just looking for clicks and hits and they have been festering and pushing this whole uh, Biden will he won't he stand he's not going to go anywhere he's staying so CNN now need to find uh, experts etc way into Fox uh, Fox don't even mention Trump it is non-stop and now Jerry Nadler has just given them more uh, fuel to pour on there while well, they started the fire and, um, well, Biden should just carry on doing what he's doing. The one good thing I will say, uh, in my opinion, that does come from all of this is Biden now knows all of the haters within his own arena. All of those who really uh, come the next administration can just go and, uh, well, Jerry Nadler, maybe Fox News have a role for you as the talking head. Yeah, because suddenly Jerry Nadler's going to be, well, he speaks good representative, oh, blah, 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 blah. Look, this was a meeting that lasted nearly two hours. It began at two this afternoon. Uh, It was a virtual meeting because, again, lawmakers have not been back to the Capitol since that debate. They're returning actually in person tomorrow. So I assume we will see even more of them joining in person, finally huddling and reconvening with their colleagues to get on the same page or not about what President Biden's future should be as the leader of their party. You see all of those names and faces on your screen. The four additions are very significant because, remember, this call that House Democratic leader Hakeem Jeffries convened uh, actually had the top Democrats on the key committees join the call. So you're talking about guys like Jerry Nadler. This is somebody who is the top Democrat on the Judiciary Committee. You're also seeing Adam Smith, the top Democrat on the Armed Services Committee. You're seeing others as well following suit. And we're we're told, according to our sources, that on the call, uh, those four expressed a lot of concern, specifically with Biden being the top of the ticket. They want to see another nominee. Others 
sources said that there was overwhelming support, for example, for Vice President Kamala Harris to step into that role with others should Biden step aside, certainly not all of them calling on him to do so. He was, uh, he did have a large defense, a fierce defense from members of the Congressional Black Caucus that were on the call. We're told uh, Barbara Lee, Maxine Waters, two veteran lawmakers from California, they defended Biden on the call as they have done publicly. We also saw a statement from another member of the Congressional Black Caucus who was not on the call, Frederica Wilson of Florida, but she criticized some of her fellow Democratic colleagues who are taking this moment to call on Biden to step aside, saying, like many others that I've talked to, that every single minute they talk about the need to replace Biden is a minute wasted that they could be talking about Trump. Also, importantly, we heard, uh, according to sources, Susan Wilde, for example, who is the Democratic ranking member on the Ethics Committee, she is a frontline Democrat, a vulnerable Democrat in Pennsylvania. She did not, according to my sources, call on Biden to step aside, but she expressed significant concern, Katie, with being able to run with Biden at the top of the ticket, with being able to campaign with him and her own reelection prospects, as we learned, of course, Angie Craig, one of the faces on that screen coming out yesterday, also a frontline Democrat, expressing the same concern. So a lot on this call. Bottom line here, this is the first of many that I expect meetings and calls this week. Uh, and unfortunately for Biden, the overall resounding sentiment is they don't know if they can trust Biden. Here's the nine uh, questions sure John Fetterman recommends. CNN asked President Biden, one ever bang a porn star, two ever bribe one, three ever been impeached, four ever been consumed by revenge, five vow to pardon January 6th insurrectionists, six pay a $25 million fine for some shitty college. Nobody's Seven, ever seen it. promise they to be a dictator. Way, I, I Eight, ever morning. destroy Roe. Nine, ever beat Trump. The, the Biden family, and they're making millions from yeah. Burisma. Now, from, think of this. From China, too. Could you imagine me doing that or my sons doing that? Or, no. Or the great Ivanka Trump doing that? A years-long investigation by Democrats on the House Oversight Committee claims former President Trump's businesses received at least $7.8 million from foreign governments during his time in office. According to the report, a bulk of, of those payments came from the Chinese government and state-owned business. Jen Psaki. I'll pronounce it wrong. Okay, Jen Psaki. I think we'll go for Bizaki. Why should I pronounce her name right? Uh, so Jen Psaki has done something very bizarre. Uh, she worked for the Obama administration. As you know, she was President Biden's White House press secretary. And as a result of that, has a very cushy job at MSNBC. Nothing wrong with that. But in my mind... Um, Loyalty starts and finishes with family. Clearly, President Biden isn't family because she has sat on the fence. And she sat on the fence on something she could so easily take an opinion with, which wouldn't really affect her career. Uh, so you're fully aware, uh, CNN, Fox News, and I'm counting at the moment, five people within the Democratic Party who have some level of position. I don't know what it is. Five. And there's an awful lot of people who have a probably more important role maybe lesser important role, who haven't rushed to say that President Biden uh, should go. So these five people, you have websites, you have newspaper columns, you have clowns at Fox News going, oh, wow, panic within the Democratic Party, chaos within the Democratic Party. One senior person, he doesn't want to be named, but there a senior person says, ah, oh, this is not good, etc., etc. So we're, talk we're not even talking double figures. But of course, within the... I don't even know what you call it. Those who are obsessed with talking about it nonstop. I don't put myself into that category, by the way. Just comment and react to it. Um, well, they have a loud mouth at the moment because maybe most people don't want to comment. So that leaves a gap of somebody commenting because journalists or whatever are calling up trying to get some dirt. They're not asking anything about Trump, like nothing. And with Jen Psaki, I'll let you hear what she had to say, but... She wasn't even sitting on the fence. By her saying she's not sure what the answer is, she's getting calls from family, family and friends. Well, good for you, Jen. To me, mm, we don't forget these things. I'm not asking you to be loyal, Jen, but you're sounding a little bit, oh, my bread's buttered now by a media company. I better go down the Jake Tapper route. You're the former White House press secretary. You know full well what's going on. You worked for the president for a while. You're in a position to give an honest testimony. You didn't do that. There's a reason you didn't do that. 
Not because you don't want to, because you get a click, yeah? You're now a TV host, you get a click, and you get interest. That's what Jen Sark is doing. She's putting money before the truth. Because if she had any level of self-confidence, somebody do me a favor. If she's, is Jen Psyche on Twitter or Jen Bazaki on Twitter? Can somebody send her this? Jen, look at me. Seriously. If you had one inch, one ounce of self-confidence, you'd be speaking up for the Bidens. You'd be telling the truth. Because what you're doing at the moment, you are pouring more manure into the suspicion box. You're weak, Jen. Very weak. You're in a very strong position. Kind of makes sense now. You wouldn't even stand up to Peter Douchebag. Jen Psaki. Yeah? You didn't make a political career. You haven't really made it at MSNBC. It's not like you would have got a job at MS, NS, MS, can't say MSNBC based on your own abilities. You've used a presidency to get your job. Not like Nicole Wallace, proven anchor. Jen, people in the Democratic Party, not your friends and family are calling you. We see you for who you are. And if you stay in and Trump is elected and everything you're warning about comes to pass, how will you feel in January? I feel as long as I gave it my all and I did the goodest job as I know I can do. That's what this is about. Now, I know, and I don't think that's what he actually thinks, but that sounded to me like something a member of his family told him over the last week or so, and that in itself is a bit concerning. And it was definitely not the answer, let's be clear. Democrats wanted to hear from the guy running on how Donald Trump poses an existential threat to democracy. That's the point of this race. He also seemed at moments a little bit in denial about the state of the race. And maybe confidence was a strategy going to this, project confidence about the path forward. But it's also not ideal for people watching and looking for a sign that he recognized the difficulty of the path ahead. I mean, overall, when the interview ended, it left us all in this sort of purgatory for the moment. I mean, it was better than debate, not a home run at all. And even if it was a home run, one interview definitely doesn't have the capacity to change the perception out there of 72 percent of voters, according to CBS poll, who do not believe that Biden has the mental or cognitive health to serve. And even the White House and the campaign know that. So what's next? I mean, as I said, tomorrow is going to potentially be a very interesting day here in Washington when lawmakers return to Capitol Hill. And then on Thursday, just four days from today, the president is going to have a solo news conference after the NATO summit. That will be another moment when he will have to clear another bar to calm nerves and essentially buy time. And all of these interviews and public appearances will be scrutinized and picked apart and dissected. They will be looked at through a lens that is har harsher, harsher than most candidates are looked at because of the moment we're facing and much harsher than the scrutiny of the convicted felon wannabe dictator he's running against. And while that's happening, while Joe Biden pushes ahead and tries to clear these bars and silence concerns that he might never be able to silence, the clock is ticking. That's just a fact. I mean, the election is less than four months away. The Democratic Convention is seven weeks away. If something else is going to happen, if there is a different path forward, it has to happen soon. And all the while, the threat of Donald Trump is only growing. With all this happening, let's not forget, the guy who is basically running on abusing power just got a green light from the Supreme Court to abuse power. The stakes of this election have never been higher than they are right now. And when it comes to the fast forward, that may be about the only thing that Democrats agree on right Dear now. Dear those who munch on this channel. Yes, that's you, you, you and you over there. Your mission, should you choose to accept, is to get yourself to invite more people along to the 24-7 Eyes channel. Please get them to subscribe any day between Monday to Sunday before 10 p.m. November 5th. For daily roasts with a political option and extra room for those wanting Dems on board. There will be gossip, banter, and funny bits to be shared every day as the British outsider Tony delivers non-stop what he's found round from America's political bag. This message will self-destruct and end in three, two, one.